So we are Julia, welcome, and we're, we're happy here and looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. And um, I'll just start by saying for those of you who showed up because of the climate change content of, of, of the title, I'm afraid that Hurricane Fiona ate that talk. So <laughs> I've, uh, I've had to, um, uh, well, not had to. I wanted to share with you a different talk, um, which has a lot of the same material, but really focuses on the size based ecology that we've been developing. Um, with the aim of trying to predict abundance in the oceans and rules related to body size. Body size uh, is a, what's called a master trait. It influences so many processes, physiological processes, biological processes, food web interactions. And I could, I could go on. Um, essentially, size matters for lots of things in the oceans, for understanding ecosystem function, ecosystem structure, and change. We use this framework for like a wide range of applications, which I'd like to share with you today. The other reason why I wanted to, to give this talk here is because the, the story actually starts here. If I can just figure out how to advance the slides, that would be good. Just a minute ago, but it has been finicky. Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I just tested it. So what is that? Okay, so like, like I would say, the story um, around the distribution of abundance and biomass in relation to body size in the ocean starts here. So um, some of you may or may not know this, but like in the, in the late 60s, 1970s, there were scientists primarily based over at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography who went out and uh, tried this machine, a cultured counter out in the ocean and you know sampled particles in the sea and they were really interested in the size distributions the patterns of abundance that went from you know the the, the poles to the tropics and um it was inspiring because it looked like there was a general pattern emerging and in one of these early paid papers sheldon and colleagues kind of pulled together uh information from the literature and, and conjectured that this pattern that they were seeing, which was that biomass on a log, log scale with body size should be invariant all the way from bacteria to whales. So this was a kind of a rule and expected pattern that started off a whole range of research questions and areas of which, you know, I'm benefiting uh, from today, you know, standing on the shoulders of, of these giants. So I guess what I'd like to, to talk about is this pattern, which is widely dubbed as Sheldon's size spectrum or Sheldon and colleagues, is how far have we come in 50 years since then? Um, do we have a sound theoretical framework to explain this widespread pattern? Can we actually predict abundance from bacteria to whales? Is there any evidence for this holding? Um, and I'd also like to share with you finally some of the recent work that's focused on trying to fill in some of the gaps in our knowledge in future directions. So just to step back a bit, now the literature around what's called a size spectrum can be pretty confusing. So I'm gonna start with a little glossary here. So up here at the top, we've got what's called a, a biomass spectrum. So we've got on the y-axis log biomass versus log 
body mass, it's the size categories of the organisms. And this flat line is, is this is the, the Sheldon conjecture that on this log log plot, you get biomass is equal across all these wide range of sizes. In the literature, you'll see other types of plots. Okay, so here we've got an abundance spectrum, which rather than biomass, it's the number, um, usually for volume, number density, versus body mass, still log log. And in order, these are the same data plotted in different ways. So if you've got your Sheldon spectrum plotted like this, you tend to get a slope of minus one. And so lots of studies will focus around the minus one, is it minus one? Also, because these are log bins and those, those bins are different sizes. If you wanna compare across studies, the bins affect the slopes uh, you know, from, from these relationships. So often what's done to correct for this is to divide by the bin width. Here you get something called normalized biomass spectrum or normalized um, abundance spectrum. And this essentially decreases the slope by one. Okay, so the normalized biomass spectrum in the literature, you'll see that'll be also minus one. The normalized abundance spectrum, usually around uh, minus two. This is all using the same data. Okay, so that's just a little bit of a technical background that people who study trees and look at size spectra will often use things called the Pareto cumulative distribution. So, and that's expected with the exact same data to have a value of minus one. So that's just to understand what you read and how we compare these. So um, I'll let you know which one I'm using through the talk. Now those patterns, so let's, let's go to the normalized biomass size spectra, have been found to be consistent in, in lots of empirical systems. So these are lakes um, and, uh, well, a couple, we've got a marine system there. Um, and you can see these size spectra all kind of converge to this minus, minus one. Okay, so incredibly, ubiquitous pattern that we observe in, in aquatic systems. Not only in aquatic systems, people have studied these patterns, I mentioned briefly, trees, soils, it keeps popping up. It, it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting generality of ecosystems. And more recently, um, some of my colleagues have compiled data across the whole world where they've been, uh, you know, brought together all of a, a bunch of estimates from bacteria to whales. Some of these are, are modeled estimates. So we're filling in with not, you know, the best data set, but they also find this pattern when we look globally. Um, so a question is kind of why does this pattern exist? What drives this pattern? And also, uh, how does it change? Does it just stay constant like that? Or how do human impacts affect this, this supposedly very stable pattern? It would be a big deal if this pattern changes, right? Given that it's so constant, so stable. This is a feature of ecosystem function that seems really important. And so uh, a lot of my research, my group's research has been dedicated to trying to uh, predict not only how that pattern emerges, but how it changes. And this is where we started out by looking at, uh, this is with Simon Jennings, who's one of my PhD supervisors. We, we use very simple theory to just look at a snapshot system. You know, what would the size spectrum or the abundance body size relationship be here in the absence of any fishing. And that's using information from, you know, the, the energy at the base of the food web and a rule based on essentially big things eat small things. And um, came up with this scaling and then compared it with, with data from the North Sea that was sampled, you know, all across the North Sea, uh, many orders of magnitude of sizes. And, you know, that work showed that there was quite a shocking uh, depletion of large fish in that system, given what it would have been in the absence of fishing. 
But that snapshot doesn't help us understand what drives change. That, that's just, you know, a, a particular point in time. And so there have been a huge range of models since the early days back in Sheldon that have tried to um, come up with a mathematical basis for how this pattern over here comes to be. And so the static approach is kind of what I've just showed you, that, that one snapshot, very simple scaling, all pretty easy linear model to apply. And down here, we've got dynamical models. These are um, models that I use are differential equations, partial differential equations to capture changes. And they're all generally based around a few processes, like uh, growth, death, uh, birth, something that drives growth, which is feeding. I mentioned big eats small that comes into play and I'll go into that in a little bit in a second. But you can see we've got a lot of different models here. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so in the early days, the goal was really to um, explain this size spectrum where all of the organisms were just treated according to size. It didn't matter if it was, you know, a small tuna, or like a small herring or something, they would be treated in the same way, they fit into the same size bin. Um, but more recently, there's been a lot of complexity added in here that we can answer questions that go far beyond understanding the size spectrum on its own. And so that's what I'm gonna um, tell you a little bit more about today. The simplest uh, dynamic size spectrum models, um, particularly the one that helped me at the beginning of my PhD was this paper, Benoit Roche. I, was really, I can't tell you how many times I've read through that paper. Um, I was really inspired to try to replicate this and then kind of extend it. And essentially the processes uh, are driven by, I mentioned, feeding. So, Organisms at a particular size tend to feed across a range of sizes. Um, and, and usually there's some sort of preferred prey size. Now to model an entire community, this kind of approach assumes that, well, we'll look at the average individual. What does the average individual do? It feeds generally on something that's maybe, I don't know, 50 to 100 times smaller in weight. Than itself and with some sort of variation around that. And that feeding drives growth through the size spectrum. And that growth drives fluxes in the number of individuals in a particular size class. Now, because everything in this system is both a predator and a prey, that feeding also results in a subtraction of death. So a removal of abundance from a particular size classes. So we've got this, this equation here, often called McKendrick, well, it's McKendrick von Forster equation, which allows us to capture that process. And uh, usually also an additional bit, which allows there to be um, reproduction in here, but they, they didn't do that in this paper. It was simpler than that. This pretty simple, um, though intricate, kind of model, which scales from an individual up to a whole community, predicts the size spectrum, okay? And when we start adding fishing mortality on this, it also predicts changes in the size spectrum that were consistent with some of the changes that we saw from the data. This jump um, to much lower abundances of the similar order of magnitude that we saw in the data. So that was really encouraging because at the time we were looking for indicators to help us with the ecosystem-based approach to fishing. And we were looking to these broad community indicators that would tell us something about how, you know, at an ecosystem level, uh, what, what things we might do to recover these ecosystems, to prevent further um, losses, and 
this was an interesting framework to test some of these indicators, as well as being like a kind of a cool, interesting toy to play with. Since then, I mentioned that I showed you that taxonomy of size spectrum models. We've been able to extend this and add more detail to capture things that are important for ecosystem-based management, things that are important for, um, uh, for people, um, which is the incorporation of um, species within this type of framework. And that's largely built on some of the work of, of colleagues such as Ken Anderson, um, John Pope, and, and others to build in this, this level of detail using information on life history traits. And what we've done to make this more practical, practical and usable is implement this type of modeling approach into a software in R called Miser. And so um, I was one of the founders and developers of this um, software tool, which we can look at different types of size spectrum models here. The simple, simplest one, maybe trait-based one, if you don't have any data, for example, for your system, but you want to characterize it more generally, it can be based on life history traits, functional traits, or actually a multi-species kind of approach, which is what kind of has taken off a bit with, with people wanting to do this for, um, for their regions to try to, to develop uh, ecosystem modeling tools that are based on this foundation of theory um, about the size spectrum. They all predict the Sheldon spectrum um, as expected, you know, without fishing, um, but they can tell us a lot more than just about the size spectrum. For those of you interested in this, this textbook is the one that I guess I, I read in my PhD, um, written here. Steve Kerr was a, a professor here at Dow and uh, Lloyd Dickey was, I think, over at BIO. And so there's lots of interesting nuggets of information going on there. And that's mostly about, you know, before species kind of entered the role here. And this is a more recent one written by Ken Anderson. This largely just describes the theory that underpins that miser model package that I, I just introduced. And, and it's also like a really readable book and, 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 and quite a nice textbook if you're interested in this, this topic and taking it further. The first um, multi-species size spectrum model was actually kind of developed at the same time as Miser. And this is when I went to go, I went, wanted to kind of uh, go and visit Ken in Denmark, went to visit Ken Anderson. I had a load of data from the North Sea. I didn't use MATLAB or anything. I was more of an R person and said, okay, like how do we put real species in this? Up until then, his models were more trait-based, just like history traits. There were no names to the species. There were no data in the papers. And so my excitement was about, well, let's put some data together and come, let's do this and try to do something that's useful um, for this system. And maybe we can provide an alternative to packages like you know, um, path with ecosystem and Atlantis. There are a number of ecosystem modeling frameworks um, and, and not to replace them, but to complement them because this is based on a very different set of uh, synthesis of understanding around how ecosystems work. And so we're able to do this, parameterize it for the North Sea. We have lots of data. data North Sea is very data rich and capture kind of, we managed to capture size distributions of each species. Um, in terms of their uh, species size spectra, which was really useful uh, and encouraging, in fact, surprising up for me, because the model wasn't fit to these size distributions. This was a verification after you know, calibrating the model. Our real goal was to try to test some indicators that were being proposed as policy at the time. So in the North Sea, there was a framework and an indicator called the large fish indicator. And uh, there was a threshold proposed for this indicator that would indicate, well, the ecosystems isn't, it's not too bad if it reaches this number 
So let's, you know, see if we can recover the ecosystem to 0 0.4. 0 0.4 was pulled out from some historic data um, on the North Sea. And you know, we wanted to see how reliable this particular indicator was. So we were, you know, running the model uh, retrospectively and then checking to see whether the single species management plans that were in place for the North Sea would do better, do better than the status quo. And so there's two scenarios shown here. The blue is the single species of all fishing at what is deemed a single species. Um, it's called FNSY fishing to achieve maximum sustainable yield versus let's just keep doing what we're doing. Um, and so you can see in both cases, these scenarios lead to fairly good recovery, the large fish indicator. But if we look at another indicator, so the size spectrum that I mentioned, um, you can see that that actually recovered with the, with the more sustainable fishing, but it didn't really recover with, you know, let's keep doing what we're doing. In other words, this is a more discerning indicator than this one. And it turned out to be that just looking at the large fish indicator alone could lead to kind of some perverse outcomes because you could have, you know, um, changes in the, the proportion of, of, of small fish give you a good outcome for the large fish indicator. And looking at one indicator alone, although it was appealing because it's easy to understand, um, wasn't really the best thing to do. Since then, we've got um, applications from uh, Cami, who's here in the audience, a postdoc doing some fantastic work, um, developing MISER models for the Southeast Australia and testing a wide range of management possibilities, incorporating interactions between fleets and uh, the trade-offs between these from both like a biological perspective, but also a socioeconomic spec perspective. We've had a more recent work, which has taken like really big step back to look at, well, how we should, how should we be fishing um, from a much broader food security and nutrition point of view? So this is work um, led by colleagues over at Lancaster University and Aaron McNeil in the back is one of the co-authors here as well. Um, so applications looking at how we might fish to achieve better nutrient outcomes, micronutrient outcomes. And this is like a different, very new type of application for this sort of modeling framework. We've been doing a lot of work over the past few years of looking at climate change impacts and um, how we interact with fishing, how, um, how ecosystems that are fished at different levels might respond uh, differently under climate scenarios. And this is just one of, of several examples that we've been working at. This is a model from the North, uh, North Pacific led by Phoebe Woodworth Jeffcoats, who is based in Hawaii. Um, and that allows, allows us to tease apart both the relative impacts of fishing and climate change, as well as the combined impacts, which appear to, to be um, synergistic. That is that together, they, they do something worse than if we consider them each alone. We've just added them together. The framework itself is not meant to be something that doesn't change. So Miser is a package in R. It's all on GitHub. We really want to build a supportive community. We really want people to feel like they can use it as a platform for their own creativity to answer their research questions. And so this is kind of what's happening in other projects. We can use it as a way to develop the theory further. And so some work um, carried out by a previous PhD student, Roman Forest J, was developing MISER as an eco-evolutionary tool. Like the traits in MISER, size of maturation, for example, don't change. But we think that size of maturation is one of these very plastic traits that can change, particularly in response to changes in fishing selectivity. And there's been a huge swathe of research about how, you know, um, size and maturation is declines, you know, due to this, the evolutionary effects of fishing. Of course, we've got ecological changes happening at the same time and those evolutionary models don't necessarily capture those at, at the same sort of time scales. 
And so when we put these together, we find that actually not all fish reduce their size and maturation under fishing scenarios. It depends on the food web. Predation plays a big role that actually is, sort of imposes a selection pressure on species that have maybe have higher predation mortality than fishing mortality. So it's an interesting way to, to use these um, tools to kind of test theories that maybe are overgeneralizations, you know, or based on a couple of species that are of commercial interest, but don't necessarily apply to the whole ecosystem. So the title of my talk has whales in it. I've shown you only fish stuff. <laughs> and you might be wondering, when am I, you know, when am I going to talk about some whales? And I guess the question was, the conjecture was about this pattern holds, this pattern should hold for bacteria to whales. And um, most of the studies, most of the modeling studies have definitely focused on the size range that is dominated by the fishes. And so that's why you see a lot of these models and particularly the pull from the ecosystem-based management approaches in fisheries has been a development uh, in this part of the size spectrum. If the sun though, there are uh, models that use almost the exact same equations, but only for zooplankton. Uh, there's some phytoplankton models out there. Um, some of our models have a few of the big things. A couple might have uh, sort of marine mammals treated almost like fishing gear or something like that. But it's a challenge and a gap to actually get to Sheldon's conjecture in terms of the modeling. We saw the plot that was uh, recently done for, from a big compilation. Um, and it's a challenge to kind of fill in these gaps. How would we do it? Do we just like treat everything like a fish or maybe, maybe, maybe not. Um, so, you know, I, I was thinking about this and realized I had sort of started thinking about it a little bit in my PhD in any way, but it's about these size-based rules. So big eats small, the theory kind of generally was assuming that, you know, hundred times smaller you feed on something a hundred times smaller than yourself. And that's the basis of a lot of the different models. And that's applied across the whole ecosystem for the community models, for the fish models. Each species might have a different number, but they generally feed on things that are, you know, in, in that ballpark. So to extend this theory to an ecosystem, to make it actually an ecosystem model, some of those rules need to be bent we need to relax some of the assumptions and we can, we can do that because it's a model, we can change it. <laughs> That's the, the fun about modeling. Um, so for example, um, we might see that uh, for whales, you, you still get this size-based feeding. It's just that it's they feed on, on the big baleen whales, obviously feed on sizes much, much smaller than themselves than most of the fish. They do experience growth. They, they, they still follow all of the, you know, the vital rates, scaling of body size. Maybe not so much cannibalistic, which some of the fishy models would assume. So you can alter some of that. Invertebrates. Uh, maybe some of the invertebrates don't feed in such a size selective way. Maybe they share energy, like detritivores. Maybe they're feeding on a common pool. So we can relax those assumptions and change them. Competition might come into play more into that, which could still be size-based. So I'm just going through a couple of different scenarios with which you can use these components as a building block to come up with a, a size-based ecosystem model that does capture a wider range of traits. Um, than just the, the sort of the fish-based one or the zooplankton-based one. And that's kind of what we've been working towards. And I, I kind of had been working toward it already, but in a really simple framework where I had extended the Benoit and Rocher model, which was purely based on pelagic size-based feeders 
um, to one that coupled this benthic system, because we know that, for example, as this, these fish got removed, and sorry about like the retro clip art here, but um, <laughs> as you remove these things, often we see this like explosion of the benthos. And so in the North Sea, we did many, you know, the Eastern Section Shelf, we see these kind of dynamics. This is a very simple way to reflect that two groups one that feeds in a size based way in, in the water column, one that's um, uh, invertebrates, they feed on all the kind of fallout, the accumulation of dead stuff um, and other uh, nice stuff that falls out of there um, and drives this other size spectrum. So we, these organisms share and compete for this energy rather than feeding in a size based way. And with that, we are able to, to do lots of stuff. I'm not going to go into it, but we fish met, we've contributed to fish met for some time because the model's um, simple, relatively simple. We can connect it to climate variables, apply it to the global scale, and try to understand what's happening more globally. It's, it's quite a simple um, approach to looking at abundance and biomass in the ocean. I'm not going to go into that. But we extended it to try to capture a range of different functional groups to look at reefs, because reefs have lots of different species. So quite appealing to try to simplify that system and categorize, categorize species according to their feeding traits, which is really well known in, in that context on reefs. And so this is work that um, with uh, Alice Rogers and Pete Mumby in a series of papers where uh, we're looking at um, not only how these different size versus detrital based benthic type of dynamics affect the size spectrum, but also other behaviors like size based hi things hive, things hive in the crevices in the, in, the, in the reefs. And when you remove those crevices, it changes the nature of the system. So what does that mean um, when we start thinking about ecosystem function and total biomass and then the capacity for the system to produce um, fisheries for people? Um, losing this ends up reducing how much productivity there is in the system. So it was a really interesting application that, that came out of collaboration with, with my colleagues here. One of the things about reefs that we were challenged by though was that there was a lot of different observations that Alice and Pete had that I certainly didn't have for like the North Sea or one of these shelf seas. So it was intriguing by from that perspective. But they didn't have they didn't measure the invertebrates. They didn't count and measure the invertebrates. And that was something that was we knew was important in this type of system. And it turns out that a lot of reef studies don't bother doing that because it's quite hard. And so one of the exciting things about working at the University of Tasmania is that uh, there's one of the best data sets in the world there called the Reef Life Survey. And there's these volunteers, citizens, and science divers, they go out and they, they count fish, they measure them. Uh, they've got these amazing, um, amazingly detailed observations. This is including the species level detail and everything. Um, and they had some information on invertebrates, but typically, no, they, they didn't make their divers count all, all of the invertebrates either. But it made us wonder what would the effect of actually including these invertebrates have on the size spectrum, because we've got this very biased view of just looking at the fishes mostly. Um, and so we, we had different ideas about this. Um, the models that I showed you on the past couple of slides, because they assume that in essentially that invertebrates were more like on the detritus pathway, they would share energy, they wouldn't be, you know, just feeding in this gradually on bigger things as they themselves get larger. But that should produce a size spectrum that is shallower and has has higher abundance of larger things, all else being equal, because their prey source doesn't decline as they get bigger. And so that was one kind of 
hypothesis. Another was that, well, actually a lot of these invertebrates are really small. Maybe they just fill in a gap in a size spectrum and maybe that is just for the small bit and maybe that could actually make the size spectrum steeper. So we didn't know, we, we um, uh, this is where as part of um, Freddie Heather, who's a PhD student recently completed at, at UTAS, and he um, reconstructed the individual body sizes of the invertebrates using some of the data that was available with invertebrate sizes, using proxies based on life history traits to reconstruct the size distributions and work this out. Um, and what we found was that uh, in support more so of the, the top hypothesis that this seemed to fill in the gaps and made size spectra generally more consistent across latitudes around the world um, when we filled in with the invertebrates. And this particularly had a big effect at the higher latitudes where there was a dominance of these organisms. That means like you're missing a big deal of, of your community here. Um, and you can see here, I've got mines too. So that's the, we're looking at the normalized abundance spectrum. Um, here minus two would be consistent with Sheldon's conjecture. And no one had really, at this stage, looked at how uh, consistent this would be for reefs and certainly at this global scale. So that was kind of really exciting for us and, and encouraging, but also, highlighted the importance of sampling these invertebrates for, the, for these types of systems. We found this difference was consistent across scales. So it tended, you know, if you look at the global, it tended to steepen things a bit. It's a bit of a difference all the way through across ecoregions and right down to the site. But there is still huge variability around the slope of that line for these systems. So what drives this? So what drives the variability? Well, we already know I showed you the impacts of fishing. Um, we, we know about climate change that affects body sizes and that has um, also can have an impact, um, perhaps a subtler impact on, on the size spectrum, perhaps not. We're still working that one out. Um, pollution, many, many things, many differences across these sites. Of course, the organisms themselves are doing different things as well. So really getting back to the organisms themselves doing different things, at the very core of the theory lies this big eat small. Big things eat small things, or yeah, big things eat small things, roughly a hundred times smaller. And we start to wonder, well, what, what would that even be for a reef system that surely it might be different than say in the North Sea. So some of our models, you know, very much based on large uh, shelf seas, not so much reef systems. What should it be? Uh, we didn't have data uh, for every species or functional group um, to look at this ratio, which is the predator to prey mass ratio. As I mentioned, 100, let's say, would be a common number. So we wanted to find out about this, and this is the work that um, kind of encompassed some of the, 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 the studies within Amy Coughlin's PhD thesis recently completed. Here, here's Amy doing some of her field work. She um, field work with a scary shark. I was like a little bit worried when I saw this photograph, it must have been. And, and, and another picture in case you ever meet her at a conference, you probably wouldn't recognize her with this scuba gear on. Um, but Amy went out and took measurements of, uh, you know, over 8,000 prey items in uh, doing gut contents. We also were doing stable isotope analysis and other stuff. But the idea here was to test the, the, the model prediction, in fact, um, an assumption that higher predator-prey mass ratios lead to shallower size spectrum slopes. So this is, I mentioned, what would happen in a model if we change the predator-prey mass, mass ratio to the whole system, like all on average things, you know, feeding on things that are much smaller than themselves, we would predict, you know, shallower size, shallower size spectrum sites and more abundance 
at large sizes, given everything else being equal. Um, so we wanted to look at this, looking at cost latitude here. And we found that the patterns across the different main functional groups in the system were quite, quite different from you know, the fish from the North Sea and other systems that have been sampled so well in this online database because of the fish, fishes. Um, and we found that for, uh, this is kind of like the pattern, uh, this is from a mixed effects model. So this is sort of the ram random effect, but you can see it more clearly here um, where we've got predator, uh, predicted predator prey mass ratio. So this is a log scale. So that, that two would be where most of the model assumptions would be. The data aren't really scattered around that. They're much higher for all of the different functional groups. They feed, so they feed further away from their own size on relatively much smaller things. And each functional group does different things. So in the models, we would assume it would just be minus two. That would be invariant with predator body mass. It would just be a, a flat line. And here we see uh, herbivores going up. That means they're getting feeding on even smaller things as they, they um, get bigger themselves. Piscophores um, doing the opposite, feeding on, on closer to their body size as they, as they get really big, becoming, uh, I guess, like more predatory. And so this is really interesting because this has implications for how we understand these communities and ecosystems. This is the functional nuts and bolts of the system. If we were to apply uh, some of the theory based on what we knew before, we would completely get it wrong. And as it turns out, that simple um, assumption that we should get a much shallower slope, uh, um, higher PPMRs, doesn't quite hold across the board. We do see a pattern um, with uh, for particularly for for warmer systems, but there's a very clear interaction here and kind of a, a scattering of points it's quite hard to, to see. So it's not something that is generalizable across the board. So that's that's an interesting feature and that means that we need to kind of dig into this a little bit more to understand what's going on and improve our models for these systems. It turns out that this predator-prey mass ratio, the differences in the predator-prey mass ratio, so not making that across the board, assumption are also crucial for representing zooplankton groups. So this is work from um, Ryan Hennigan, who's now at QUT, but did his PhD with, um, with us down here. And he developed a zooplankton centric size spectrum model with, this was one of our papers that zooplankton are not fish. So we need to, you know, we need to kind of resolve these feeding details. And doing that enabled us to predict patterns that were consistent with the data in terms of the geographical patterns in abundance. If we hadn't reflected those traits properly, we didn't, these patterns wouldn't have emerged from the models. I mentioned the eco-evolutionary model that we've been working on, which allows traits to change. And so you can look at any trait, the previous one was um, size at maturation, but we wondered what would happen if we seeded this model, everything starting the same, predator-prey mass ratio of 100, but we, we let evolution and the eco-evolutionary eco dynamics run its course, what would emerge? And um, what would happen, for example, if we changed you know, the food availability to the system? Would, would that change the emergent pattern as well? And so it's interesting because this model does have has different pseudo species. So the different species have different maximum sizes. But, um, and at the beginning, they were all pretty much doing the same thing with feeding. But through the course of the model, they differentiated themselves. The smaller species uh, developed um, lower predator prey mass ratios. Um, the intermediate sort of kind of in the ballpark of a lot of the data that we have, 
And the really big ones kind of adopted one of two strategies, either fees like on the really, really small stuff or closer to yourself. And that strategy became more important um, as, as there was more food available. And so when we reduced food, you know, we had this dominant of feed on the small stuff. That's the, that's the resource that's, I, I guess, more plentiful for them to, to survive. So that, that was kind of a really interesting finding. Getting back to the size spectrum, looking at the size spectra that emerged from these scenarios, virtually identical. Um, so you can have this kind of complexity emerging with the traits, very minimal effect on the community size spectrum. It was essentially the Sheldon spectrum in all cases and some sort of self-organization going on uh, to maintain a system that, you know, is well, like the system that we would expect it to be in the absence of these impacts. So, um, kind of we're learning a lot by incorporating these different processes, by questioning our assumptions, by you know confronting these models with data. I still haven't mentioned whales. So um, <laughs> that kind of gets us to where we are now. Um, and so luckily uh, at the University of Tasmania, we're kind of a gateway to Antarctica. And we've got a lot of uh, resources dedicated to sampling the Southern Ocean. And there's just been launched um, a couple of large programs. This one, Australian Antarctic Program Partnership, 10 year program, and ACES, Australian Center of Excellence in Antarctic Science, has kicked off just at the beginning of this year. And the cool thing about this program is that it's bringing together lots of different data streams and modeling streams from the, the physics to the biogeochemistry to the ecology. And so we've been building a miser model for the Southern Ocean that spans not quite bacteria to whales, but micro zooplankton to whales. And um, it builds on a lot of the information that we've been well, not me, but others have collected uh, from the system. Um, this is the region that we're working on. And, you know, up here, we've got a lot of cool data streams to try to patch together what the empirical size spectrum looks like. A bit like that earlier study that I showed you before, but with some cool things like floats, what comes out of the satellites, what about our bioacoustic animal tags, um, and also our modeling approaches. Um, if I, I think that by integrating the data and the models together in a way that uh, sort of more um, technically learns from each other, that we can understand these systems a lot better. You know, how they change through time uh, will then, I guess, enable us to have a much more rigorous understanding of how these changes occur through time. If we can represent the present better, we can have more uh, greater um, certainty, I suppose, about what's happening under uh, climate change similar uh, scenarios, for example, We're working to try to make those more robust to try to reduce uncertainty. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of exciting data streams and Things like machine learning, the coupling of statistical and kind of ecological mathematical models that we can we can learn from. That requires a lot of skills. Kind of some of it's a bit scary, maybe you know, uh, machine learning, mathematics, you know, for biologists. But um, it just kind of leads me to my my last. Oh no, it's not my last slide. But anyway, I'm going to mention it. One of the things that we try to offer a, a lot at IMAS is this program in quantitative marine science. So we're really dedicated to building capacity of uh, creating capacity and skills and training. And that's something that I myself has kind of enjoyed and have worked a lot on trying to help train uh, another generation of people doing all this cool modeling stuff. But there's a lot more to do. So if you're interested in this, you know, get in touch. I wanted to add this final note about 
Sheldon. Okay, so Sheldon spectrum is described pretty widely as the first uh, the first conjecture about biomass invariance or biomass equivalence rules, some people call it. Um, of course, there was some work earlier on by Charles Elton, who, Elton, who was a, an ecologist who was looking at food webs, and he was really in, he wrote a book, Animal Ecology, and he's describing it, you know, kind of like big and small, but with a, a lot more nuance. And, you know, people have studied these Eltonian pyramids, which kind of correspond to size spectra if you plot them according to body size rather than trophic level. And he talks a lot about the food size uh, distributions and that sort of thing. So the seas were there in the terrestrial literature, which kind of got lost a bit because people think of size spectra as a marine thing or an aquatic thing that you know, lots of lake people study too, but not so much terrestrial. So um, it was really interesting when I published that paper um, in tree, which showed that kind of taxonomy, talks all about where are we since Sheldon. Uh, I, I got an email from a, a Russian scientist, uh, Leonard Polisha, and he sent me this photograph, which maybe is quite hard to see, the paper's written in Russian. And it turns out that actually the first conjecture of the size spectrum was for the soil fauna. And and not, it's not a marine thing, um, or not only a marine thing, I should say. And this was back in 1944. So he, he sent me this photograph. I was really fascinated by this. And I thought like, wow, has anyone compared this or you know, looked at it? So we worked together and kind of grabbed the data from these old papers and try to put them side by side on the same plot. And so, uh, We've got the soils and the open ocean here, data um, from Sheldon, and you can see very similar patterns. Um, and people who are working on the soils are looking at size spectra, indicators, empirical stuff, but not really developing mathematical models like we've done in the marine realm. So apart from maybe Mattingly, which is one of this flagship for actually studying everything in the world, so I just wanted to kind of leave on that note that there's lots of discoveries to be made, even though we think, you know, we sometimes know everything there is to know. There's always these surprises that come. Um, and this one was particularly intriguing to me. We can certainly predict much more than the community size spectrum with the range of approaches that we've got uh, emerging. Um, and but really we're only beginning to understand how ecosystems are structured and using this as a tool to predict whole ecosystems from bacteria to whales. Um, so I've just kind of ended a bit here with uh, some key questions that I don't know, people might wanna pick up or be interested in discussing. So we, we get these size spectra, they look the same in a lot of cases. But we know that the mechanisms are different. The soil fauna don't necessarily do the same thing as in marine systems. So what's, what are the multiple mechanisms that can give rise to these patterns? What processes are most important across scales and systems? And more on the applied, and how can we use these models to better manage ecosystems? You know, we're, we're still really not there yet with the ecosystem approach to fisheries and uh, aquatic management, environmental management in general. So, you know, is this a tool that we can, can develop to use that? And I'll, I'll just end there and mention that one of the, the sort of outcomes of the work uh, with, with Derek and um, well, others here at, at Dalhousie has kind of resulted in this very cool joint degree program between these two locations, um, Dalhousie uh, here in Canada and Tasmania at the University of Tasmania. And, you know, if people are interested in this, it's not necessarily just PhD degrees with us, but, you know, anyone in the, in, in the two universities um, provides this, this funding and whatnot. So if you're inspired by this, um, I guess let us know and, you know, we can try to 
help you. This is where we work. This is the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies. Not too bad of a location. And I just want to thank my research group and many collaborators over the years um, for all the support because uh, the, none of this would be possible without these collaborations and, and um, the learning that we do together as our mentors and students. So thanks everyone. And thank you. Maybe from the online audience, so I'll monitor those for you. Okay. Uh, but I appreciate the engagement of the audience here. And I was just going to remark how well this fits with our seminar yesterday with Daniel Pauli. And I wonder whether you see any linkages between the two. He also talked about changes in size spectra due to uh, oxygen limitation. Is that something you see mm -hmm. emerging as an important factor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been looking into it. In fact, um, uh, a few years ago, I had a PhD thesis back when I was working at Sheffield, and we were reading the controversial debate that was emerging, in, emerging at the time that Daniel was talking about the physiologist not liking any of this. The elastic bands, or <laughs> anyway. Um, and so, I've got some miser made the, the modeling framework that we have makes assumptions, obviously but it's flexible enough to accommodate different processes. So what we've been trying to do is incorporate uh, a model that say reflects a little bit more like the gold hypothesis um, with oxygen um, limitation. The thing is, is that there's a number of ways that you can get reductions in body size. And so the there's lots of theory too that relates temperature to metabolism. At the end of the day, it comes down to costs. So he's talking about the oxygen demand being the limiting factor. And I don't disagree with that, but it's not the only limiting factor. And so all of these different variables can interact. And um, I think the challenge is trying to to take a multiple hypothesis approach and adequately test it with some really good data. And, you know, there have been some experimental studies that have and have not shown shrinking fish uh, due to oxygen. And there, there's a lot of detail in there that has yet to be unpacked. Um, was that your yeah. range of oxygen yeah. theory? Yeah, yeah. But certainly the, we, our models would predict with warming. Um, depending on the, the type of assumptions your model has, that generally things would get smaller, unless there's more food happening at the same time, then they might get bigger. So you can, you know, there are things that, many things that can change in climate change. You have to, you have to integrate all of these changes, not just one variable. Okay. Do you have a, like, steam on this graph? Wonderful 